Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam. Peace be unto you. My name is Salam al Mariati, President of the Muslim Public Affairs Council, and welcome you to uh, another great uh, presentation of uh, the International Museum of Muslim Culture. And I uh, just wanted to provide some uh, opening uh, context uh, of why this is important, not just for the Muslim community, but for uh, the American nation as a whole. Uh, as we've witnessed, uh, you know, throughout, uh, for example, my experience as a, a student of this educational system, when we learn history, there is a blotting out of a major section of world history, and that is the section involving Islamic civilization. And that blotting out is the worst form of dehumanization and demonization when there is an omission uh, of what we represent, what our legacy is as Muslims, as American Muslims, and as Americans. And when they talk about Western civilization and there is a uh, cultural war between Islam and the West, a large section, a large uh, part of that is because of the omission of Islamic world history and Islamic civilization from our textbooks. So when I visited Jackson, Mississippi, uh, I think it's been three years, or two or three years, I, I met a great person named uh, Akola Rashid uh, through the referral of another great uh, Muslim, American Muslim, Imam Clement El Amin. And he told me I should talk to her because there's something important there and I did and when I visited Jackson um, I visited the uh, International Museum of Muslim Cultures and I was amazed at what America is missing from the contributions of this museum. Number two, as Muslims in, in, in America we are not complete unless we know what American Islam is. And we don't know American Islam unless we know the experience of African American Muslims. And we don't know that unless we understand the contributions of African Islam to Islamic civilization. It is not just about Arab Islam. And what I mean by Arab Islam, it is important for us to learn the Arabic language because that is the language of the Quran and that's the language of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, peace and blessings be upon him. But that is not to be confused with the mixing of Arab culture with our Islamic faith. And definitely that should never be the omission of African Islam to Islamic history and Islamic civilization, especially when we learn from the International Museum of Muslim Culture the great intellectual contributions of Bali and Timbuktu uh, and Darfur and so many other places throughout Africa. The great Muslim traveler, Ibn Battuta wrote that when he was traveling through the Sub-Saharan Africa, it was the most secure place he had ever been. You would not have to worry about bandits and it was pristine and it was made so that people could feel comfortable. That is the contributions. And now when we go throughout the Muslim world, whether in Africa or Asia, unfortunately, um, we see the, um, the um, debilitating circumstances there from war and civil strife and an erosion of our intellectualism. We can reconnect with that intellectualism through the International Museum of Muslim Culture. And that is why MPAC is a proud sponsor of this great project. And with that, I'd love to introduce to you the person that uh, I met and a big reason for us being together, uh, Sister Akola Rashid. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Thank you, my brother. Uh, all of the great things that he said about me, I just want to really turn them back onto him. Uh, 
he is a very special and a unique person. He, when he came to Mississippi, he came um, with the uh, Homeland Security. Uh, they were doing hearings, you know, for uh, the interfaith community. And, uh, you know, he was very, uh, he's a, a consultant partner with, with them, uh, with that agency that was presenting the, um, uh, that hearing. But uh, we got a chance to take him to lunch and to spend some time with him. Right. And I want to say that, you know, he is a very special person in terms of many of those things that he said is a reflection of his true conviction. And I just wanted to. Alhamdulillah. About him, really. <laughs> and it was a wonderful lunch and wonderful, more wonderful to be with you and your husband that day. And uh, also wonderful to hear your testimony for the, for the commission that I was on to protect houses of worship. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so um, we'll just, uh, uh, we're going to, this, let me just say this. In an hour, we can't really cover very much about our theme tonight, you know. Uh, you hopefully you've gotten the uh, announcements, you've gotten the uh, you know the promotion. You know that it's about a religious based social justice model uh, to save the soul of America, and the way that we are approaching it is that we're looking at the civil rights movement and the African American Muslim movement as actually parallel movements that uh, represented one freedom struggle in America, across the globe, historically. There's only one freedom struggle and uh, the African-Americans uh, struggle is one up from slavery. And so uh, that's, what the, uh, that's what our theme is and that's what we're gonna be discussing. Uh, we, the, through the museum, we uh, a bit of research, but uh, this whole project is about um, pushing, uh, uh, as uh, Salam has said, moving the scholarly community to do the research because that's what's uh, that's what uh, that's why we're where we are is that the scholarly community, uh, the media, and all of these other think tanks they've not really looked at. Uh, uh, the uh, civil rights movement and connecting it to the uh, African American Muslim movement. So we'll talk. Uh, we're going to be talking about that. But before we get into that, I would like to at least uh, just introduce our um, uh, conversationalists uh, of tonight. Before you do that, Akola, I forgot to mention that we have a video to show before we get to the panel. So is it okay if I cue the video first? Okay, let, let us let us watch the video. Thank you. Sure. And my apologies. Great. Can everyone see this? Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. Born into a sharecropping family of 10 siblings in rural Mississippi, the idea of dignity and racial justice has long been a core value for me. My most vivid memory as a young child of five is my father's daring escape with our family from the plantation like Mississippi Delta in the wee hours of the morning. Those early years of racial oppression and denial of opportunity were damaging. Yet what I found to be most destructive was the educational deficit I experienced as a result of having to work through the harvest season, which left only half the school year but I started school from the fourth grade and never missed a day and graduated with honors. There is an inner dignity in Islam called fitra, your natural inner nature that is already programmed for excellence. One's belief in one's own ability to achieve what one sets out to do. The idea of education is at the core of what motivates this work for me. And so I've tied that to this concept of nurturing the inner dignity within our young people to unleash their human potential. For Muslims, the term dignity means inherent nobility, honor, worth, a born sense of leadership and self-governance. As you connect to the creator, that becomes self-evident. 
It is clearly expressed in the first paragraph of the Declaration of Independence. The founding fathers talk about assuming among the powers of the earth, the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitled them. How are you going to get young people to embrace the idea of being free thinkers if you can't connect them to this? The scholar W.D. Muhammad said, life is as a seed. For plants, if you lose the seed, no food. And human life, if you lose what it means to be human, that inner dignity, future loss. You're not going to be able to navigate your way to this excellent human being that God created. The museum has worked across the divide of race, class, culture, as well as religion to better understand our shared humanity through exhibition, programming, and a civil rights, human rights curriculum. We launched an Islamic Thought Institute and we are expanding the museum's reach nationally through our traveling exhibit program. We're not just saying to museums, we have this exhibit. We actually utilize what we call a community-driven model to engage communities to build diverse collaborations. Our current exhibit challenges the negative narratives and stereotypes. Prophet Muhammad historically established pluralistic communities of Muslim, Christians, and Jews living together in harmony. These covenants have become the basis for freedom of what we call liberating theologies. Muhammad says, you will never enter paradise until you believe, and you will not believe until you love one another. There is one God and thus one humanity so he says, spread peace. During the freedom movement in America, African-Americans wanted two things. One was civil rights represented by Dr. Martin Luther King. The other was inner dignity represented by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. But really it was one freedom movement. And so we represent those two poles coming together. Islam is a peace movement for freedom that continues into today as one movement for dignity, equity, and social justice, connecting with Black Lives Matter, immigrants' rights, indigenous people's rights. We need to work together to establish this pluralistic environment that we call divine unity, or in Islam, Tahid. That's what the freedom movement is all about. People responding to that inner nature that you can't keep down as a human being. We all have a path to get back to our own being. How does every human being come to that, to achieve this divine destiny of doing good and fostering peace? To get to this destiny is what it means to be a free human being. Thank you. That was profound and inspiring, Sister Okolo. Thank you for your wonderful work. Thank you. Uh -huh. Standing ovation. If we were in a room, there would be a standing ovation right now. Wow. <laughs> you humble me. Thank you very much, Brother Hamdulillah. Uh, uh, I, you know, chose to want to open our discussion up with that uh, brief uh, documentary because I wanted to say that the theme of everything uh, that the museum stands for, the core of our programming is really based on that uh, inner dignity or human dignity, uh, the importance of nurturing uh, that inner dignity of human beings. And so I, I just wanted to say that um, um, a couple of things just about that is that uh, so you could better understand uh, what, what drives me every day and been, been driving me since I was born that I, I didn't know that. 
but even more so when I came to know it. Uh, as the video, you know, as I said on the video, is that, um, you know, uh, when I uh, was a small child uh, and uh, having the difficulties that I had, uh, and as it indicated that, you know, for up through up until I got to the fourth grade, uh, you know, we, you know, my parents were sharecroppers, so I was I was sharecropping along with them. So uh, the, the lack of, you know, adequate education, you know, undereducated. Uh, it, I'm sure when I when we moved to Jackson and and I was able to go to school full time, I um, uh, I probably I'm sure I had an F uh, grade, right? But somehow <laughs> I continued to go to school every single day. I never missed a day out of school from the fourth grade to the 12th grade. And, you know, just, I guess, being there, showing up, striving. So, uh, you know, I was able to graduate with honors and I didn't understand what, what drove me. My mom, you know, she was, my mom wasn't the one that drove me. I was getting up on my own. So it was only after years <laughs> of not knowing until I embraced Islam and these, uh, uh, these principles, that principle that I talked about, uh, of that inner dignity called fitra, the, the natural nature uh, that, that God deposits in every human being uh, toward excellence. <laughs> so that has driven me to at least get people to take a look at that, you know, let's look at what that means and what's missing, you know, in young people's lives. Mm -hmm. And so um, I just wanted to, to say that uh, as I uh, go to introducing our uh, uh, panelists that's going to be having this conversation, this brief conversation, really, because uh, we already 20 minutes into our, our uh, uh, discussion. So uh, first we have uh, Imam Fahim Shuaib. Uh, he is uh, the Imam, uh, founding Imam, uh, been the Imam for uh, 30 plus years of the Warsadine uh, 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 Masjid in uh, California, uh, Oakland. Uh, we have, and we, uh, when they, when they, uh, uh, when they respond, they'll just tell you just a little bit more about themselves, right? But I'm just introducing them. I also have Pastor Alan Cole, who has just uh, <clears throat> uh, blanked off for a minute, but uh, he is with um, Go Ye Ministries, uh, Go Ye Therefore Ministries. Uh, it, he is, it is a non-denominational ministry uh, he is located in Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, I'm looking forward to you getting a chance to hear this, this young brother. <clears throat> uh, very excited to have him join us. Uh, and uh, our uh, other uh, panelists is Dr. Lord Ashton. <clears throat> For those that have uh, had an opportunity to do our, uh, to, to be a part of our earlier webinar that we did uh, in December, uh, Lord was one of our guest speakers there, but Lord uh, is right now, uh, he's the VP for, uh, um, let's see, I know Lord as a professor at Tougaloo, and he's worked with us since, almost since uh, our inception, since he's been in Jackson, but he's the chief academic officer for class to class, and he'll tell you a little bit more about himself. Uh, in a minute. And we're going to have Rabbi uh, uh, Joseph Rosen. He is uh, the new rabbi. He's, uh, he's been uh, at Beth Israel for about um, a year and a half. So he'll be joining us uh, in a few minutes. He should be here uh, a little bit later. Uh, so uh, let's just start the discussion <laughs> around uh, this issue, uh, this theme that we're that we we're presenting today. Now, I want to I want to uh, kind of preference it, and and really, <clears throat> I'm feeling a little pressured now because you know our time is really has escaped us. But uh, I want to just uh, kind of couch it in the moment, uh, just having us to reflect on the moment. Right, um, and the moment 
is 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 uh, it's pretty broad, but I want to start with <clears throat> the George Floyd tele televised gruesome murder that actually shocked the sensibilities and awakened the conscience of America, but those across the globe. And it's been called a racial pandemic. It's one of these pandemics that we're having. They talk about the, the uh, uh, coronavirus pandemic. They talk about the economic uh, uh, meltdown as a pandemic. And then of course, the racial reckoning. And you can add now, you know, just as we were just trying to wrap our minds around those pandemics, then we just had January 6th, uh, a coup they taunt <laughs> on our government, right? So uh, the times are critical and uh, there is a need to save the soul of America and to save the soul of the globe, uh, the, the, the community around the globe. Uh, and so um, uh, what I, you know, uh, as a student uh, of religion, I call this moment the day of religion. <laughs> and I get that concept, day of religion, from uh, my teacher, uh, a scholar and, and, and leader whom I respect greatly. Uh, that's Imam Warthadi Muhammad. <clears throat> uh, in Arabic, it's called Yom Adin, right? And so uh, most people say the day of judgment. But he, he decided to rephrase that he said, if you, if you look at it, just, uh, you know, just translate it out of Arabic without doing anything, it really says day of religion. And day of religion, uh, we're told in, in scripture, not just in Islam, but in scripture, it is in fact a day of reckoning, but it's also called the day of the debt, <laughs> right? And that's what reckoning is, right? Uh, and so I would say that it's not just a racial reckoning, but this is in fact a reckoning for America and, and the globe. So this, this day of religion uh, and uh, uh, clearly a day of reckoning. But as we reflect on that, and as I reflected on that, really just focusing on the George Floyd uh, phenomenal, I'm calling it, uh, because I do believe that God used George Floyd, uh, you know, out of all of the other incidents that had happened in, in a similar way, but he used George Floyd to awaken the conscience, to shock uh, our sensibilities, to bring us back into a sense of uh, having, having, having a, um, uh, being in contact with that inner dignity, right? That inner consciousness. And so uh, uh, that led me, and I'm gonna share, I'm just sharing with you how it affected um, my thinking it led me to remember Dr. Martin Luther King and remember uh, him warning us 50 plus years ago, right? That he talked about the Vietnam War and, and beyond, beyond Vietnam, he said that the war was only a symptom of a deeper disease within the American spirit. So that's why we are uh, using that theme as uh, saving the soul of America. And, and, and we're talking about this religious um, based social justice model. So I'm just gonna uh, say to kind of shorten it and maybe we'll have a, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, come back and, 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 and relate some more if we have time, but just to shorten uh, uh, the you know my part in the discussion. I want to say that. <clears throat> um, okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, so just to shorten uh, my my uh, my um, presentation, I just want to say that let's just look at one aspect of this discussion, and that is is that um, Imam Muhammad, when he came on the scene. Uh, uh, after uh, becoming the new leader of the Nation of Islam after his father passed, he made a, a very interesting observation. He said that uh, 
that the African-American struggle for racial dignity and justice and freedom during the 60s, we lost it. And he attributed it to a corrupt society as well as a, a corrupt government. Now he didn't use the word COINTELPRO, uh, but he, he spoke of it, meaning that he said that it was infiltrators. Uh, you know, that uh, COINTELPRO counterintelligence uh, program that our American government, the FBI, uh, uh, had to actually, their plan was, it was a conspiracy to destroy the African-American freedom movement. Uh, they say it in there, uh, you know, it, and now everyone has access to it. And they had the Nation of Islam way before Dr. Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement, they had the, the Nation of Islam and its leadership as the number one enemy in America. So, uh, so he, he, but he, after saying that, what he, what he, uh, um, he asserted that, however, there are two great leaders in our history that best represent what we as African-Americans wanted in this country. One was the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, who uh, uh, strove for inner dignity, <laughs> the restore of inner dignity within the African-American. And it represented itself in nationalism, separatism, and self-determination, right? And the other a great hero is Dr. Martin Luther King, who strove for what Imam Muhammad called it is out of comfort. Uh, but it's in essence, he called it integration, civil rights. Uh, so rights, you know, fighting for our rights as, as equal citizen. So out of those two persons, uh, 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 Imam Muhammad, uh, so that led me during this particular time to go back and, and do further study. And uh, what I came to conclude, and this is my conclusion, cause you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that we're running late, uh, but my conclusion is that uh, in studying, uh, uh, I, you know, as a student of Imam Muhammad, I know our, our story, I know, I know, I know our uh, path, but uh, I had to go back and re-discover uh, uh, Martin Luther King in a different way in, in, a, in this particular time. And I came to learn that uh, his transformation was mostly manifested in his uh, Beyond Vietnam speech when he made that public. And after that, for that whole year, you know, because he was assassinated one year after that speech. But within that speech, he revealed uh, that he had transformed into a uh, he uh, he was uh, he was um, addressing America's disease, and you you know uh, a, a disease. Uh, 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 within the soul of a country, of a nation, that means its core values. Uh, There's that, that something wrong with the core values. So he, he called for a radical revolution of values and a profound shift in America's uh, structure, you know, it, it, as a nation. And in that, he, he expressed what a genuine revolution of values was. And he actually talked about the fact that uh, America was to uh, stop uh, looking at class racism, uh, race, uh, going beyond its own borders, loving mankind <laughs> as one human race. Uh, so in doing that, clearly, if you study King and you study that last year, you would understand that he was in fact going beyond civil rights to human rights. And he really was placing religious values as a core of the civil rights movement. So in essence, he was uh, philosophically uh, re-articulating uh, the social, uh, 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 the, the social uh, thought within the civil rights 
uh, to really bring it into uh, what we're calling this uh, uh, this religious-based social justice model. And Imam Muhammad did the same thing. So I'm going to stop there and uh, allow my guests to kind of respond to that. But I want to let you know that uh, our guest has had an opportunity to read uh, much of the uh, concepts around this idea. So they're not just gonna necessarily be responding to this uh, brief presentation, but they will be, they, they will be responding to uh, the other materials that they have read. So let us just start with uh, Imam uh, Shuaib. Thank you. <clears throat> Bismillah rahman rahim with God's name, the merciful benefactor, the merciful redeemer. Thank you so much. A very, very touching profile uh, that we began this with is very, very rich. Alhamdulillah, congratulations. Honored to be a part of it. I'm going to keep myself in, a, in, in around a two minute uh, piece just as an introduction. It's already been stated that I am the resident imam of Masjid al theme in Oakland, California. Alhamdulillah, and I would, uh, one of my greatest honors is, as uh, Okola has mentioned, is that to be a student of Imam Wadidin Muhammad, to have learned at his feet in his presence, because actually Oakland, outside of Chicago, was the only other place where Imam Muhammad was a resident imam. So I was honored to be there with him uh, on that, in that, and so uh, as a credential, I, I take that to be of the of the utmost. Uh, having had the benefit of, of reading uh, the proposal, which also is 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 a part of this uh, the purpose of this presentation, understanding again the 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 dual the dual purpose and the dual focus uh, to um, our um, offer of hey, this is one of the ways that the problem of society can be solved. And I, I'm actually going to just go ahead and stick to and raise to our awareness, uh, or rather amplify, because I, I, I'm sure that that we're not completely oblivious to it. But cognitive dissonance is a term that comes to mind, and double-mindedness comes to mind. And there's this dual quality uh, of America overall, and in in consequence of that, there there's a dual. Uh, there's this this duplicity on on so many levels, and what goes what goes along with that is also hypocrisy. But that's not that's not the emphasis. That's just the character of this thing, this American experiment. This American experiment is something that was really born with that uh, quote unquote uh, duality, that that kind of dichotomy, that kind of polarity. We were born, and I say we as America because what Imam Muhammad did that uh, that the, the the community before him that he quote unquote inherited and became uh, the leader of he boldly picked up the american flag and 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 walked or uh, walked across the stage uh, in the in the mosque at that time he's saying if you won't pick it up then i'll pick it up because he was he was showing us that look there's two americas <laughs> there's america the beautiful and there's America the Beast. I mean, you have to recognize that. There's the Dr. Jekyll and there's the Mr. Hyde. Uh, when I was in Jackson, Mississippi, I did go to the other uh, museum there, the Civil Rights, the Civil Rights Museum. And one of one of the one of the strong impression making uh, presentations uh, there was the piece that showed the the conflict between, I believe it was James Madison and his wife about the issue of uh, slavery, that he, he was one that was quote unquote, sort of all right with slavery and she was very much against slavery. This is in the house. And I think he was the vice president or something at that time or, or became the vice president. But the point is that this, this duality, this cognitive dissonance, this, this double-mindedness about race and its relations in America, is born with the nation itself. And that's the problem that hasn't been solved inside of this American experiment. And so it, and, and there's so many things that, that, that speak to that. And I know I'm beyond, beyond two minutes right now. Uh, I, I would say also it's, it's the idea of getting to the real root of the 
problem, and I and I and I'm I'm going to cut out because this is a conversation. So there's more to be said, and if the opportunity to say it uh, comes, and then we'll do that. Uh, Henry David Thoreau, uh, his statement is: "There are a thousand hacking at the branches of evil to one who is striking at the root." And so a big, a big part of what is the root of what makes us what we are is very much embedded in, yes, religion for sure, but it's anthropology, it's psychology, it's culture, and, and our leaders in that movement, I can think about Ida, Ida B. Wells and Frederick Douglass, and there's a conversation, a letter that he sent to her that speaks to this duality, this duplicity, and speaks to that speaks to that problem and that problem being in the culture itself. So this is a project, this is a project that aims at bringing a new innovative revolutionary uh, of, of hack, let's say, at the root of the problem. And I'll just cut and we'll have the conversation will continue. Happy to be here. Thank you. Excellent. Okay, uh, next Pastor Alan Cole. Well, thank you uh, for this opportunity. And I, I, I've heard some great information today and, and, and saw some great things. Uh, real quick, my, my background is I grew up in Meridian, Mississippi. I was adopted, born in 1967, integrated my elementary school. Um, went in the military, served honorably in the 82nd Airborne and worked in, in the music industry as an executive, having shaped and influence culture. I believe there are three types of people in the world, those that make things happen, those that watch things happen, and those that ask what happened. And as a person that has really pro projected, if you will, and or predicted what the future was gonna be when it comes to music and entertainment, having worked for an individual like a Clive Davis who drives the, the music narrative, you learn certain traits. Um, I, I, I'll just say this, and, and, and all that, that's been said and trying to keep it brief, America has a heart problem because mankind has a heart problem and has always has a, has a, had, had a heart problem. I look at the, the, the Bible and you look, love doesn't do it for, for man. It is the principles of God that, that shape us and give us an abundant life because if love did it, there would not be all these different new covenants that, that we study in the Bible that God had to make with his people. So when you look at where we are now, and, and this is just a quick overview, this is just, and I'm a prophet and I'm gonna say it, I'm gonna walk in it at this point. You know, you look at Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, he wasn't, he wasn't validated for 700 years. So I'm going to say this, when you look at Genesis chapter 15, you know the scripture, chapter 15, 13 through 15, that, that when, where, where God is talking to Abram, and he says, you know, your people shall be in a land uh, that is not theirs, and they shall serve them for 400 years, and after that there will be judgment, and they shall have great increase. You look at America from 1619 to 2019 is 400 years. We're Abraham, no matter what, we're all, to me, descendants of Abraham. And I want to reread scripture. He says, I will make you a father of many nations. God is a God of nations. He's not a God of countries. He's a God of nations. And with that being said, 2019 represented the end of the 400-year period. 2020 was the year of judgment. Donald Trump, the president, was the ultimate catalyst for the heart of America. He brought out what was truly in America. You mentioned George Floyd. You look at George Floyd, he looks like a black man from Africa, not a black man from Houston or Minnesota. When you look at his characteristics, his traits, and what we've seen in this country in the last 50 years, and this is truly why I believe they killed Martin Luther King Jr., Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., and uh, uh, Brother Malcolm X, um, is because the heart, and I'm going to say this, America, democracy and white supremacy are synonymous. It's not about Republican or Democrat, because at the end of the day, you go to a, you have Europeans that go to an African continent, broker, broker a deal with those brothers down there and bring free labor to America. 
the whole point of it was greed, was to expand the land. So in the last 50 years, when we talk about the last 50 years, they read the same, the heart of that evil man reads the same Bible. So you had to get rid, rid of that leadership that was changing and shifting. So we're, we're in a period where we're going through judgment. And while it wasn't so much about let us integrate as much as it is, as it was about let us be equal, just treat us equal. We can handle our own. Don't tell us to pull us ourselves up by our bootstraps when we have no boots. It's one thing to do that. So when, when you look at this whole dichotomy of what we're experiencing, it's a hard issue, whether it's white on black oppression, whether it's black on black crime and what we've experienced as a nation. And this is just what I've seen. When you, over the last 30 years, when certain administrations have come in and certain things have been done, you look at from the 90s when they enacted the, the new prison legislation that has caused this mass incarceration, pr privatized prisons, and that at the same time they took civics out of schools. Once you took civics out of schools, you began the ignorantization. And I'm gonna to speak to the music industry. The word hip hop, and I got, I'm gonna do this in one minute or less. The word hip hop means knowledge movement. To be hip is to be knowledgeable, to hop is to move. Hip hop is a knowledge movement and it was street, uh, street reporters sharing the experience. They, they forced out the executives that was pushing the hip hop knowledge agenda brought in those that, that, that would just do anything. You look at what BET did in the 90s and you look at every, every great uh, black institution of culture has been sold to corporate America. Now I'm not gonna go into the whole white thing. I'm gonna go into the green thing. It was an economic situation, but at the same time, a destruction of people. Because if you're privatizing prison, you're doing it for a reason for profitability. So over the last 50 years, we have seen this country be shaped and destroyed just based on continuous greed, which has led to a lack of care. I, I love that. I'm not even familiar with the word fitra, but I love it. It's, it's going into my vocabulary to be inner dignity is what we all desire. Even when you have young people talking about you disrespecting me, it's that inner dignity that they're striving for, but they're just in the dark reaching. And what happens when you reach and flail in the dark, you slap your brother, you hit your brother and your brother hits you. And that's where we are just based on a nation that is about economics because we saw what, what, what was at the heart of it. The pandemic impacted us all just like this ice storm did. Some worse than others, but a rich man with a big house and no water and no heat and no electricity will freeze to death the same way that man poor man across the street will as well. So it's a heart issue in America. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, let's uh, hear from Lloyd. Dr. Lloyd Ashton. Lloyd is my friend. So I sometimes call him Lloyd. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you, Cole. It's really such an honor to be here in this great panel. And I'm, I'm so pleased. I, a little bit of an apology. My, uh, I'm looking after my twins this evening. And so one of them is very interested in participating. Um, what I'm going to, I mean, there were some, there's so many great points of intersection here and some good questions that have come up in the discussion chat. I think we need to get to those. The one main point I want to say from teaching 14 years at Tougaloo College, one of Okolo's alma maters, and taking my students down to the museum and working with the museum, um, you know, doing the, the major international well, conference well, that we did, it. is that oh, the, the narrative that is not known um, and needs to be told that the museum does so well is to challenge this story of American history, which is largely written through a white superiority lens that completely marginalizes the contributions of all kinds of people and all kinds of cultures because religious pluralism and cultural pluralism was there at the beginning and it was strong um, and it's always been a part of the American story and there isn't one American story there are 
thousands of American stories because there are thousands of American cultures. And the contributions <laughs> of all of these great thinkers, all of these great leaders is what has made the American experiment so vital in terms of assisting um, other movements around the rest of the world. Um, so I'm going to leave it right there because I know that my students would have a lot more to say, but I want to to cede time over to our other panelists and to open up for, for conversations. But please, if you have not had a chance to either go online and see the exhibits of the museum, please do. They are amazing. And when you're in Jackson, you have to go to the museum. Okay, so we have a uh, uh, young Rabbi Joseph Rosen. Uh, uh, I did introduce you earlier, but what I had said, uh, Joseph, is that if you could just say a little bit more about yourself and then just go right into responding uh, to what we talked about, but uh, you know, you also have the material, so you, you are up on all of this. Sure, thanks for having me. Sorry I had to come in a little bit late. Uh, so my name is Joseph Rosen. I'm the rabbi at Beth Israel Congregation in Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, I've been in Mississippi now for just under two years. I'm originally from Rochester, Minnesota. Um, and growing up in Minnesota, the civil rights movement and learning about racism and the struggle of encountering people other than yourself, um, for me, was limited to what was in the history textbook. It was in black and white photos. It was never something um, that as a white man, um, I was truly exposed to. Um, Rochester um, has diversity. The Mayo Clinic brings in a lot of physicians and a lot of medical professionals from around the world. Um, in my high school, there was always this idea that we kind of boasted that we were one of the most diverse high schools because 32 languages were spoken uh, at our high school, but we studied that fact, but never actually got to know each other in that way. Um, thinking about my education, we always studied that diversity exists and that it is good, but I can't ever remember truly having conversations with people other than myself um, about what that experience is like. Um, when I came down here to start at Beth Israel, uh, one of the major parts of the congregation's history uh, was the way that it was thrown into the civil rights movement because of its then outspoken rabbi, uh, Rabbi Perry Nussbaum, who preached from the pulpit uh, the necessity for equality and equity amongst people. Um, and opened up the congregation to a lot of hate, especially from the Ku Klux Klan, to the extent that on September 18th, 1967, uh, the congregation was bombed, the rabbi's office, um, the place where I sit and do everyday work. Um, in fact, on parts of the buildings, uh, congregants have told me that you can apparently still see some of the scarring uh, from the blast. And then later that November, uh, his house was bombed. And the congregation uh, really struggled with this because they didn't know where their voice was. Um, and many of the congregants were afraid of this kind of activism just because they didn't want the target on their backs. Um, Jewish people having a history of persecution, they didn't want another reason to be scared. Uh, and something what was really learned out of that experience, uh, especially when I got to study it uh, again, when I arrived down here, uh, was this importance of listening. That in the Jewish tradition, there's a philosopher, uh, Emmanuel Levinas, a French Jewish philosopher, who talks about the idea of experiencing the other to the extent that when we listen to one another, we're actually able to put our own personal needs aside so that we can truly feel the needs of another person, that we can put them, put their needs in front of ours. And so when we, Okolo and I had the chance to talk a little bit yesterday about some of the 
some of the history and about Imam Muhammad and about the act of listening that is so important um, and hearing the many different voices, um, the places where we're aligned, where our histories are aligned and the places where, where there are tensions as well, things that we still have to struggle with and grow with together. We only do that by listening to each other. Excellent. Thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, Lloyd, if you could um, ask that other question. I'm sorry, what, what question is that, Okolo? Oh, that's okay. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have it in front of me, sorry. Okay, no problem. I knew, I knew that. I, I knew you weren't going to be able to uh, be as, as engaged because of your beautiful child, and we, we respect that. Uh, we were just, uh, 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 I guess the other question that I wanted to ask was, after everyone uh, gave their uh, responses and perspective, wanted to have um, you to talk about uh, this idea of us having a religious-based social justice model uh, to save the soul of America as a movement, uh, working uh, with uh, the interfaith community uh, and reflecting on a, a, an exhibit that we have that talks about the story of uh, the prophet Muhammad who established pluralistic interfaith, uh, multicultural a community and in establishing this community, he established it primarily first um, engaging with the interfaith community and then the interfaith community and bonding and, 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 and developing uh, this uh, relationship were able to then engage the greater public uh, to move policies and, and, and ideas that would help to support this, this uh, human dignity uh, and uh, human rights <laughs> of, of, of all people. So uh, right now, uh, the museum is embarking upon uh, such project. And, uh, you know, we talked about it in the materials that you, uh, 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 that we share with you. So I just wanted to uh, just have a response from you uh, in terms of what you and your institution uh, think about uh, us, really, again, uh, uh, forming these, uh, uh, these, what I call dynamic uh, interfaith and broad-based community partnerships, because that's what the museum, uh, we're building on this foundation that the museum have been doing uh, over the last 20 years, is building those kinds of uh, partnerships and actually using uh, that relationship uh, to move and engage the broader community. Is it open to anyone? Oh, uh, yes, please uh, go go right ahead. We can keep the same order as before. Okay. Um, there, there are two things, uh, two, two citations that I've mentioned without much elaboration. Uh, there's, the, there's an overarching uh, order in the Quran to the Muslims uh, that says, let there arise out of you a band or a group of people, the term is ummah, which in your paper you identify with the beloved community uh, that we get from uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and those who subscribe to it. That effectively, essentially is the same thing. And that's what it, it calls for, that verse, which is the 104th verse of the third chapter of the Quran, chapter Ali Imran. It is saying, let there arise out of you a group of people calling to all that is good, enjoining what is right, forbidding what is wrong, believing in God, those are the ones that will be successful. And I, I can't think of any uh, group, faith group uh, that have a belief in God at all that would find pause for that because it's calling for universal values. And I would have to get into the, the terminology itself that would take much more time than we wanna take for right now. But that's the universal call of Islam. That's the job and the mission of, of, of all Muslims. And in the 143rd uh, verse, in the second chapter of the Quran, interesting that this verse is exactly in the middle of the second chapter of the Quran. And it speaks about a, an ummah justly balanced. It's talking about a balanced group of people. And it and shows that your job as Muslims, you say you are a Muslim, then you have a job 
uh, to provide modeling for the people at large, just as Muhammad is a model for you. So we, we've been given very, very clear instructions as to what to do. And one last uh, uh, verse that I'll mention in this connection, meaning that it, it is in the wheelhouse of Muslims to do exactly what is being proposed uh, uh, for the project. In verse, uh, in the, I believe it's the third chapter of the 60, in the 64th verse, I believe it's Ali Imran. I, I, I might, well, let's not be wrong if you can help it. <laughs> so yeah, it's chapter, it's chapter three, uh, verse 64. I read a, a, an expression of it. Uh, it says, say to the people of the book, O people of the book, that means everyone who has a scripture, O people of the book, come to common terms between us and you. We have to learn how to speak the same language, not Arabic, not English. It's our religious, moral, ethical uh, language. Come to common terms between us and you that we worship none but God and we associate no partners with him and that we don't erect from among ourselves as gods and patrons other than God. And so that's what it invites us to. And that's how we should be. It's like, what can we agree on? What kind of compact can we make that doesn't disparage anyone? It doesn't discriminate against anyone. It doesn't you know, diminish anyone. How can we get on common terms? And that is a part of the project too. We do need to come to what, what kind of language are we going to use? What terms are going to mean what, which speak to the objects that we hope to achieve? Excellent, excellent. Great point, great point. Thank you for, for sharing that. Um, <clears throat> when, I, when I first encountered the, the museum and what really, really piqued my interest is Abraham. You're gonna, you know, it's, it's the connection. We're all brothers, you know, and, and brothers in that Abraham is the father of it all in through the lineage of, of Jesus and through the, the, through the lineage of uh, 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 Prophet Muhammad. So at the end of the day, if you're Christian, if you believe the Bible, you believe what it says, and, I, and I'm going to speak on that because that's what I know the most about. Jesus gave, I mean, you look at the Old Testament and it talked about the law, but Jesus came that to be the example to fulfill. He said, I have not come to destroy the law, the, the law, but to fulfill it. So he gave three commandments that we should love God, that we should love our neighbor, and that we should love one another. And so the opportunity is there for us to do this. We look at, someone posed a question regarding human rights versus civil rights. Human rights is basically the right that belong to every person, the right to be able to take care of themselves, the right to be able to have protection. You look at uh, the higher hierarchy law and all of that. They're just certain basic things. When you look at civil rights, that's based on citizenship of a, of a nation. So human rights and civil rights are really two different things. And when we look at, you know, the civil rights movement, we're, we're just one, that was, that was about equality within, under, by, through, with the law of America. Right. When you look at the human rights aspect of it, you, you, you've you trampled on both. And so we have a duty and responsibility if we truly are walking in love, walking in purpose, spiritually, religiously to connect and speak as, 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 as uh, brother, pronounce that for me, Shaibi? I am Shuaib. Yes, Shuaib. Shuaib. As he said, we need to be speaking the one language. And it's not the the it's not English, as he said. It's it's the language to me of love and, and humanity. Because if the water comes up, I'm I'm six feet tall. If the water comes up to six feet five inches, it's gonna drown most of the people. So when we, we need to find that common ground. And that's what, and if I can just speak about the museum, that's what I love about the museum, the opportunity. And, and I'm, I'm, I don't know how many Christian brothers you've asked to participate in this and how many have participated in it, but it's so important if we want to say, for God so loved the world that he gave his own, you know, we want to quote the scripture, but, but are we living 
the scripture because I heard a, a, a pastor say one time, if we all met at God in love, then we all will get the benefit of that harvest. So I don't know if I answered the question, but I was certainly wanted to address one of the things that I saw in the chat regarding human rights versus civil rights, you know, and, and, and clarify that. But I mean, this is, this is awesome. And I'm, I'm just, I hope we're going to do it again. That's what I'll say. I'd love to come back. I'm just, okay. oh, this is awesome. Lloyd? Yes, Sokolo, thank you. Uh, I'm going to cede my time to, to the good rabbi, so because I know we're, we're two minutes over already. So, um, okay. And I had a chance to speak at the previous webinar, so thank you. Okay, thank you, Lloyd. Yeah, so when we're talking about what it means to do this from a faith-based space, I think... Um, uh, Pastor Cole, what you really uh, talked about there as uh, children of Abraham, and I was glad that before you cited um, that you'll be a father to many nations, um, there's the story um, that Jews read when we're reading through Torah, when we're uh, making our way through Genesis, we come through the establishment of the covenant, um, and there's the scenes where Abraham in his early days of forming a relationship with God, especially when he is starting a family. Um, he has two children. He has Isaac and Ishmael. Um, and out of Sarah's jealousy, uh, Ishmael and his mother Hagar are, are banished. Um, and we have this scene that we still read as a part of the Jewish tradition in which we still read the verses where God speaks to Hagar and Ishmael and to comfort them and to say, you will become a great nation. And in many places uh, uh, in Jewish tradition talks about uh, the tension of that relationship of what happened in that scene. Um, and in the meal, in the blessing after the meal, uh, one of the most interesting things I've discovered when studying my tradition, especially when while becoming a rabbi, um, in the blessing after the meal, there's these lines, these uh, harachaman, um, praying to the compassionate one, to God, uh, for certain outcomes in the world. And one of those lines is the reconciliation between the descendants of Sarah and the descendants of Hagar. Um, that there's this idea that despite differences, we are meant to struggle together mm. to piece together the path mm. ahead. Mm. Um, and when Imam Shuai mentioned uh, the people of the book, a lot of the times that uh, people in the Jewish community in interpret that as referring to people of the book as people of the Torah as talking about the Jews. And when uh, I had the chance to visit the museum and Okola was showing me around and we saw copies um, and translations of the documents uh, that existed between Muslims and Jews um, for proper and fair taxes for, there was a system of coexistence set to set up. And we don't always hear that history when we're talking about, especially the early middle ages, especially from a Jewish perspective mm -hmm. um, where everything is written from the viewpoint of exile. We don't uplift that. We sometimes too much, we uplift the tensions and our differences and not about the things that we share together. Um, so when we're talking about coming uh, to this mission from a faith-based perspective, it's about where are the places where Torah and the Talmud speak to the Christian Bible that speak to the Quran, where there are verses that almost sound the same. Um, in uh, preparing my rabbinic thesis, uh, I studied interpretations of Cain and Abel um, mm -hmm. in rabbinic and medieval eras. And the story of Cain and Abel is included in the canonization of the Christian Bible, and it's there in the Quran. And it's told differently than it is in Genesis, but it's told the same way as it is 
in a different Jewish interpretation that was written in the early centuries of the common era. We have all these differences, but we also have all these similarities and we don't lift those up enough. And so for me, it's about lifting up those similarities um, as a means to lay the groundwork to deal with our differences and to deal with the unique needs that each community has. I, I want to just chime in real quick to respond to, 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 to Rabbi Rosen. I, I would agree. And, you know, it's so funny you, you mentioned um, Isaac and then Ishmael. But the, 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 the truth of the matter is it's Ishmael, then Isaac, you know, and it, what, what, what amazes me, and I'm just going to say this, is the arrogance of, of, of Christians to believe that Isaac is greater than Ishmael. Yes, because the covenant was established according to the Hebrew Bible. Yes, it was established with Abraham regarding Isaac, but there was also a covenant established with Abram, who was the man before he was given the new name, Abraham. And it was Abram that did lay with, with Hagar and, and create Ishmael. So at the end of the day, if, if daddy got a child by his wife and daddy got a child, as we would say in our community, got an outside child, He's still the father of all of the children that he seeded. And that's what that that's that common factor for us, whether we whether we say we're Islamic, whether we say that we're Jewish, or whether we say that we're Christian. Abraham is the is the is the is the is the center of it all. And, and that that connecting being on earth that we all agree that there were there were promises established. And I think that's the hope. I'm glad you shared what you shared about. Uh, what what happens, you know, in your faith regarding what is talked about, because that's that's so important, and, and and we just can't lose sight of that. And that's why, to me, it's so important that no matter no matter the faith that we all come together and talk. Because it's like, like I said, global warming. Well, I didn't say this, but global warming impacts us all. If you believe, whether you believe it or not, it's still a factor. You can believe that it's cold outside or not. I don't, you know, but. Below 32 degrees will freeze everything and everybody, except for maybe tequila. <laughs> okay. Is she frozen? I think she's frozen. 32 degrees, huh? <laughs> Well, you know that's the that's the temperatures, but you know at the end of the day, it, this is this is a common a common opportunity for us to 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 be together, and um, it's just a delight. I mean, I, I I was nervous and didn't know what to expect in in a, in a in a conversation like this, and I I don't even know that I feel qualified to be here. I do know that I'm humbled to be on this panel with 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 great minds and hearts, if you will. To, to, to discuss our common, our common uh, likeness as opposed to our common differences. Okay. So uh, are we facilitating ourselves now? <laughs> 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 Who's got the steering wheel? Well, the, I, 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 since she, she mentioned George Floyd and, and uh, Cain and Abel were mentioned and uh, uh, scripturally speaking, I think that people of scripture, the, the greater opportunities we have to share with each other, that's it. In the, in the fifth chapter of the Quran, uh, the 30th through the 33rd verse, the story, the, the story, a story of uh, the two sons of Adam, Cain mm -hmm. and Abel, the names aren't actually used. Uh, but you know, because of that continuation, because of the nature of the narrative, that you're actually speaking about the same thing. I, I made I made a connection, and and we always say God knows best. <clears throat> between the Derek Chauvin, who was the policeman that uh, murdered George Floyd, uh, the, a connection between that, and I won't go to the to the whole elaboration of it, but I found it significant that his name was Chauvin, Derek Chauvin, and then mm. when you add into that chauvinism, 
you throw in the, the idea of chauvinism and how it was out of that chauvinism. I mean, an extension and embodiment of it. It was a drama of the, the I think that this is why it was so, so profoundly impactful in, to the world itself because it aptly actually captured the, uh, what do you call it, uh, when something, grotesque. Mm -hmm. It captured the grotesque nature and history of the world under chauvinism. Now, chauvinism is not just between blacks and whites. You know, I mean, you know, blacks and whites, that's not my preferred language, but blacks and whites have been, you know, fundamentally the poster children of, you know, hatred, uh, undying hatred uh, between uh, groups of people. But the chauvinism just taken as I am better than you and your life is is cheaper than my life and your life is not worth my life and i'm always and anybody can can jump in anytime the the other side the uh, another uh, important picture of this and i i don't know if anybody has 3 hours anymore to watch a film but in the the movie gangs of new york there's an important point before the the climax of everything basically like collapsing and falling apart and the the quote unquote the low class fighting against the high class they were having a a conversation in a pool parlor uh of the you know the hoi folloi i sometimes call them and they were debating what should we do about this and about that i said we never have to worry the answer was we never have to worry about the poor because you can always get one half of the poor to kill the other half so, so mm. you know, Derek Chauvin was in no better a demographic position other than color of skin, et cetera, uh, than uh, because of the nature of our culture, not because of the color of his skin, it's because the way that the culture, the caste system such as it is, was structured to give the high ground to anyone in, quote, white flesh. Uh, but it, it was actually that, uh, that, that chauvinism that, 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 that cause him to think that I'm better than you and my life is is better than yours and and so that whole the whole idea of not being of equal worth and not being of equal value while at the same time failing to recognize hey brother you are as poor as I am you are as low on the total pole as I am but by some by 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 some uh well I know what it is it's the cultural consensus trans of, of white supremacy you've been led to believe blindly that and by the badge that your life is more fit than mine and if i take your life i don't have much to worry about because the nature of the system will protect me um thank you so much for your comments imam shoaib um i realize okolo must be having wi-fi issues now um we yeah. are 15 minutes past the mark and that is you know it's testimony to how interesting this conversation has been. So thank you all so much for your time. Thank you to our attendees as well for listening in. Um, inshallah, there will be more webinars down the road. So we look forward to engaging you all. Okay. So thank you all. Thank I you. did just receive a text from Okolo and uh, it looks like she's had a power outage and her Wi-Fi is oh, off. So oh, she oh, <laughs> is oh. giving her regrets, but is saying that she wishes um, that she could join this wonderful conversation, but to, she looks forward to the next one and uh, will be joining us again soon. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone, Thank and you. have a great evening. All right. Thank you. Thank you. God bless. Thank you.